Dr. Gulick is the Division Director of Infectious Diseases at Cornell Weill Medical Center in New York City, which according to Hamilton is the greatest city in the world. Um, he's going to be uh, talking to us about updates from several of the recent HIV conferences, which as everybody knows has gone virtual, uh, but it's kind of hard to understand all the data that has been presented. So Tripp, we're real happy to have you with us and look forward to your presentation. Great, thanks, Mike. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Welcome to everybody. Good morning from Manhattan. Uh, I'm pleased to give updates from recent HIV conferences focusing on CROI and AIDS 2020. I have no disclosures. What I'd like to review in this presentation is really news you can use about HIV epidemiology, HIV treatment, and HIV prevention. As we know, the two big HIV meetings so far this year were both virtual. So CROI 2020 back in March, and then the AIDS 2020 meeting held in July. And what I'd like to do is focus, as mentioned, on the new epidemiology of HIV, focus on antiretroviral therapy, important questions like what to start, drug resistance, weight gain, pregnancy, and then briefly on some new drugs. Then I'll turn my attention to prevention and then end up with a single cure case. So epidemiology. Every year at the AIDS 2020 meeting, the UN AIDS coincides by updating their epidemiologic data. So what you see here is the representative chart, the global summary of the AIDS epidemic from UN AIDS. And as you can see, the number of people living with HIV today is the highest that it's ever been. And of course, that's a testament to the effectiveness of our therapy today. 38 million people living with HIV across the globe. In 2019, 1.7 million were newly infected with HIV. And that has continued to go down, as you can see in the graph, from the peak at over 22.5 million people in the mid 1990s. But note the dot on 2020, we are below what the target level was. We are not meeting that in terms of reducing HIV infections globally. AIDS related deaths, there were just under 700,000. You can see that number two has been declining since the mid 2000s. And note that we're pretty close to achieving the UN AIDS target shown again with the dot at 2020. Really interesting information was presented at CROI about community viremia from Australia. This was a longitudinal cohort study, so from 2012 to 2017. They followed nearly 15,000 gay and bisexual men with HIV and another 100,000 without HIV and had a sentinel surveillance system of sexual health clinics, general practices, community testing sites, and three hospitals in New South Wales and Victoria, which are the two most populated uh, parts of Australia, accounting for 60% of the Australian population. And the good news is what you see from 2012 to 2017, note over in the curve, uh, HIV viremia in people with HIV decreased from 17% detectable to 4% detectable. That's highly statistically significant. People who hadn't been diagnosed yet with HIV on presentation, no surprise that about 10% of them uh, continued to have viremia. But the community viremia, as shown in the graph, declined from about 29% in 2012 down to 13% in 2017. And in parallel to that, was HIV incidence, which was 0.88 per 100 person years, uh, about 0.8% or 0.9, down to 0.22 per 100 person years or 0.2%, highly statistically significant. So they concluded that the decrease in community viremia was strongly associated with the decrease in HIV incidence and noted that part of this decrease occurred before HIV PrEP. We heard updated life expectancy data from Kaiser Permanente, as you know, a big healthcare system uh, centered on the West Coast and 
through other spots in the United States. They looked at a cohort of adults with HIV in care from 2000 to 2016, and that was just under 40,000, and matched them one to 10 with people living without HIV, just under 390,000. The study population, the average age was 41. There was good representation, 5% Asian, 25% Black, 24% Latinx, and under half were white. About 70%, as you would guess, MSM, 20% were heterosexual, 8% injection drug users. And what they saw was, in terms of mapping life expectancy, that there's been narrowing of the survival gap, as shown for you there. So what we're looking at are the number of remaining years estimated for someone age 21 who's HIV infected in orange and who's HIV negative in blue. And you can see from 2000 to 2016, that gap continues to narrow. So that we're looking at now between 50 and 60 additional years. So life expectancy going from 70 into the 70s or even into the 80s. In fact, when they looked at people who started ART before the CD4 had dropped to 500, there was no gap at all. The life expectancy was the same for HIV infected versus HIV uninfected. What wasn't uh, as uh, promising was the fact that there was no improvement in years without comorbidities. So cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular, liver, kidney, and lung disease, the comorbidity-free years did not really change for people living with HIV between 2000 and 2016. And that's obviously an area we need to do better. You're going to have a whole talk uh, by Raj Gandhi later on about the intersection of COVID-19 and HIV. But one study that was presented at the IAS meeting caught my attention, and that's from the Veterans Administration. They looked at all veterans with HIV, and as you can see, that's about 31,000 veterans living with HIV, matched them one to two in terms of age, race, race ethnicity, and the site, and that uh, constituted about 76,000 uninfected veterans. And then they looked for differences or similarities in COVID workup. The first thing to note is that HIV infected people were about 39% more likely to have been tested for COVID-19. I guess that doesn't surprise us. But what was reassuring was that outcomes in terms of ICU admissions, intubations, and death were not statistically different between veterans living with HIV and veterans without HIV. And these kind of results have been seen in other cohorts. It looks like COVID-19 uh, does not uh, affect HIV more so than any other part of the population, although people have made the point that uncontrolled HIV may be an exception to that. Well, let's move to antiretroviral therapy. What to start? There was an interesting pooled analysis of two very large studies looking at integrase inhibitors, either Bictegravir or Dolutegravir, in people over the age of 50, which we all appreciate is an increasing number of people living with HIV. These were two phase three studies in treatment-naive patients, and they used state-of-the-art regimens, either TAF-FTC Bictegravir versus Dolutegravir with either Abacavir 3TC or TAF FTC. And we're looking at viral suppression rates uh, by the end of three years. What you see here is BIC is in blue, dolutegravir in pink and orange. On the left side are people above the age of 50, and on the right side, those less than 50. But actually, it doesn't matter because, in terms of suppression to less than 50 at three years, you can see that all groups exceeded 80%. There was also comparable safety and efficacy in the older group versus the younger group, and no drug resistance emerged in any treatment group. This reassures us that integrase inhibitor regimens as initial therapy are appropriate for people either above the age of 50 or below, and we can expect excellent treatment outcomes. What about inflammation? As two-drug ART has found its way into initial therapy, People have gone back to look, are there any negative reasons uh, to, 
to be concerned about two drug therapy. This is a Spanish cohort called uh, CORS, C O I R S, and it's about 8,400 Spaniards, otherwise healthy people living with HIV who are suppressed on ART. About 7,600 continued three drug therapy. 424 changed to two drug ART, and 327 changed to one drug ART. That's a strategy we would no longer recommend, and the authors acknowledge that. There were no differences in endpoints of death or end organ disease, but they went on to look at biomarkers of inflammation and found something interesting. And what we're looking at here is what were the odds of detectable biomarkers for inflammation, the ones you see listed there, for the group on three drugs compared with two drugs. And what they found was statistically significantly higher numbers of people on two drugs had D-dimers, as you can see here, detectable, or CRP, so two markers of inflammation. Is this clinically important? Well, we don't know. What about drug resistance? What's been happening there? Good data presented at CROI uh, looked at trends in HIV drug resistance in the United States from 2012 to 2018. They looked at de-identified samples from routine HIV resistance testing on nearly 85,000 people. The analysis was restricted to people who did have substantial genotypic resistance to at least one ART class, and that accounted for about a third of the submitted samples. So what they looked at were changes from 2012 to 2018, and that's what's shown in the graph. So 2012 is in blue, 2018 in orange, and we're looking at one, two, three, and four class resistance. And you can tell just by examining the graph that what we're seeing is less resistance going from 2012 to 2018 in terms of two, three, and four class. And of course, slightly greater in one class resistance. When they looked at drug classes, they found that resistance to NNRTIs was about the same, about three quarters, but resistance to all other classes decreased over time, including to nukes going from 55 to 41, protease inhibitors 15 to 8%, and even integrase inhibitors, 20% down to 17%. Multi-class drug resistance and four drug class resistance was decreasing and rare. And they ascribe these trends to the availability of improved and more convenient ART options. And I think we'd agree. What about weight gain, a new problem with ART? Well, the study that has perhaps best shown this is called ADVANCE, and this is a South African study of people living with HIV who were uh, treatment naive and randomized to three state-of-the-art regimens. So TDF, FTC, Afavirenz, an older regimen for us, but state-of-the-art in South Africa, and then two dolutegravir regimens with either TDF or TAF in addition to FTC and dolutegravir about 350 per arm. Suppression rates at the end of two years were between 74 and 79%, so all groups did well. There was more reverse transcriptase inhibitor resistance in the efavirenz arm, as we might guess, but the real telling thing from this study was weight gain. So what you see here is up on top, weight gain in men and women are at the bottom, and you can see consistent weight gain through the end of three years on all three of these regimens. Uh, in red is the TAF FTC dolutegravir, and the greatest weight increase was in that group, followed by the TDF FTC dolutegravir in blue, and then the efavirenz regimen in green. So there is significant weight gain and even greater in the dolutegravir arms and greatest in the TAF dolutegravir arms. This is probably the best data we have to show that this is a phenomenon that is occurring. The next question that comes up, of course, is what to do about it. So there are preliminary studies that have tried to look at this. What if we stopped TAF? So that was the goal of the TANGO study, which was to go to three drug regimens down to two drug regimens. So people on a three drug regimen with TAF who were suppressed were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either continue three drugs or drop the TAF and go with dolutegravir 3TC. And this was uh, in about 686 patients. One limitation was that there were only 8% women. 
In terms of virologic suppression, going down to two drugs was not inferior to three drugs. Um, and we've heard that data before, but then they went back and looked at weights. Was there any difference in weight in terms of the group that dropped the TAF? So what you're seeing here is change in weight in kilograms before dropping the TAF, which you'd expect no difference. But then after dropping the TAF, you can see nearly the same amount of weight gain. And those who increase more than 10% of weight over time, again, not different between the two drug and the three drug group. So they concluded that changing to two drugs was not associated with weight loss compared with continuing three. Another group called the OPERA cohort analyzed 7,000 patients on ART with suppression who changed from TDF to TAF and maintained their third drug or changed to an integrase inhibitor. And in this graph here, we're looking at the people who changed from an NNRTI or a PI to an integrase inhibitor. And you can see before the change, weights are relatively stable and then weights increase with all three of the integrase inhibitors testing. They went back and looked, was there any difference in weight in terms of those who changed from TDF to TAF? And they really didn't see a difference over time. Well, what about changing specifically to TDF3TC deraverine? What would be the effect there? Again, this study was not designed to do that, but they did do that to look at virologic changes and then went back and assessed the weight gain. So these were people who changed from a PI, NNRTI, or INSTI-based regimen to the regimen of TDF3TC deraverine. And uh, they were randomized two to one to switch immediately or delay that switch. And you can see it's a big study of about 656 patients. Virologically, that was a successful maneuver, but they went back and looked at weight trends. And what they saw was really no difference in weight in either the group that switched immediately, those who maintain their regimen or change their regimen, there were similar weight gains. And that was in the immediate switch group and then the group that switched later, similar. So they concluded that patients on TAF and an INSTI at baseline did not lose weight by switching to TDF and deraverine. Where does that leave us here? Well, we need further studies really to show us how to cope with the weight gain that appears associated with both integrase inhibitors and TAF. What about pregnancy? We've been well aware of the association between dolutegravir and neural tube defects. And this has really been led by data from a study called SUPAMO in Botswana. And we heard an update at the IAS 2020 conference from Rebecca Zash from Boston. And they continued to follow birth defects in Boston. They now are following about 70% of live births in the entire country. What you see here is neural tube defect prevalence um, in the last year, which was the update. And the last time we heard this, there was uh, about a 0.3% incidence of neural tube defects associated with taking dolutegravir at the time of conception. You can see that with further numbers, that has decreased to 0.19%. How does that compare? Well, you can see other groups, people taking non-dolutegravir art at conception, 0.11%, people taking dolutegravir during pregnancy, but not at conception, 0.04%, and then the control HIV negative women, 0.07%. So while this number is numerically greater, all these numbers are quite low. They concluded that there was one excess neural tube defect per thousand treated during conception. The VESTED study was an impact study of ART in pregnancy, and they enrolled ART naive pregnant women living with HIV at 14 to 28 weeks gestation in nine countries, mostly in Africa. The study treatment was dolutegravir with TAF-FTC or TDF-FTC or the control arm of TDF-FTC afavirenz. And they looked at virologic effects, and you can see that all three groups did better, did fine, but dolutegravir was actually statistically significantly better. 98% on the two dolutegravir arms versus 91% in a There were two babies who were born with HIV, 
But the most important data from this study was pregnancy adverse outcomes. And this in, was about 24% in the TAF group and 33% in the other two groups. This is now the largest experience we have with TAF in pregnancy, and it enforces that TAF is likely safe in pregnancy. What about new drugs? Well, Connie Benson's going to do a whole talk on this, but I'll give you a preview of some of the headlines from the conference. Fostemzivir is a small molecule that binds to GP120 and prevents attachment, as you know. The BRIGHT was a phase three study in heavily treatment experienced patients, and the, uh, those who had one to two remaining ART classes are shown here in blue, and those who had no remaining options are shown in green. They optimized their regimen and added fostemzivir, or in the randomized cohort, placebo and then switched over. And you can see we have significant numbers of patients who were able to resuppress with that strategy. That led to the FDA approval of fostemzivir as the 33rd antiretroviral drug earlier this year. Injectable cabotegravir and rolpivirine continues to be an interesting regimen. And uh, one of the big stories from CROI was the ATLAS 2M study this was an open-label non-inferiority study of over a thousand people who were on standard of care ART or switched to cabral pivarine long acting, and then went ahead in this study and switched to either getting the injectables every four weeks or every eight weeks. And as you know, the prior studies looked at every four weeks. Injection site reactions were common, but the good news was there was no difference in virologic efficacy in terms of maintenance between the Q4 and the Q8 week uh, results. So we can conclude that Q8 week looks as good as Q4 for injectable cab rilpivirine. The new capsid inhibitor now has a name, lenacapavir, uh, shows potent activity in the test tube. It has a very long half-life and can be available both as oral and sub-Q formulations. We heard phase one studies before and a new, which showed uh, significant antiviral activity as shown here, a single dose led to two log drop by the end of nine days that was recently published. And the new news from the IAS conference was that a single dose over time with a new sustained delivery formulation, single dose can lead to target levels for six months. So this may be one of the future antiretrovirals that we could dose very infrequently. And it's being studied both for treatment and for prevention. Islatrovir is the new name for the NRTTI, the translocation nuke. It too has a long half-life, 50 to 60 hours. And uh, we previously heard the results of a phase 2B study showing that significant numbers of people were able to suppress on Islatrovir deravirine novel two drug regimens compared with a control three drug regimen. What was new uh, was that the incidence of side effects was also comparable between the three groups, and future studies are planned, again, both for treatment and for prevention. Speaking of prevention, probably the biggest news at the IAS conference was the HPTN 083 study, and Rafi Landovitz is going to be talking about PrEP at this meeting. And this was a head-to-head -head comparison of intramuscular cabotegravir, the investigational integrase inhibitor versus standard daily oral TDF FTC. Big study, over 4,500 people and good representation from young people. So two thirds were less than 30, 12% were transgender women and half were black in the US. And they were randomized to receive either injectable cab every two months or daily oral pills. And what did they find? This is looking at the new HIV infections. You can see there were more in blue in the TDF-FTC group than in the CAB group. And they were able to claim that CAB was both non-inferior and actually statistically superior to oral daily TDF-FTC. CAB remains not approved yet, but this is going to be an option, again, both for prevention and treatment in the future. 
The Discover study was the TAF FTC versus TDF FTC head to head comparison. We'd previously seen the 96 week data shown for you here, which established the non inferiority of TAF FTC to TDF FTC. And what we heard new at the query meeting was additional safety information that showed bone and renal markers, as you would guess, were improved with TAF. The weight gain was also new, and you can see that there was a statistically significantly higher weight gain in the people that got TAF in the first year, one kilogram difference, versus in the second year, again, about one kilogram difference. The HVTN702 vaccine study was a disappointment. This is the one that followed the Thai vaccine study, which had shown some efficacy. This was done in South Africa and 5,400 South Africans stopped early by the DSMB because there was no difference in terms of new HIV infections. So this vaccine did not show efficacy in South Africa. And then lastly, Cure, and Janet Silicano is following me with a whole talk on Cure, but one of the big headlines from the IAS 2020 meeting was the so-called Sao Paulo patients. Uh, this was a study of 30 patients in Brazil on first-line ART who had CD4s above 350 and were suppressed. And the study treatment was to add dolutegravir, maraviroc, and nicotinamide to their current ART agent and then follow them over time and offer some people a treatment interruption. Now, why did they pick Maraviroc and nicotinamide? Well, there's a thinking that Maraviroc can actually block HIV transcription through its CCR5 blocking. Nicotinamide does a different thing, which is to inhibit HDAC, which as you will recall, can reverse cell latency. So would all this together actually lead to better suppression? and potentially cure. And here's what they found. So in a single patient in this 30 patient study, when they went on that multi-drug therapy, they dropped their viral load, as you would guess, had a couple of blips, which was interesting. So maybe the, the reservoir was being activated, then went back on their regular regimen and then stopped everything and viral load remained undetectable. They couldn't find HIV, RNA, or DNA in the blood co-culturing peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Interestingly, this person's HIV ELISA reverted to negative, although their Western blot stayed positive, and none of the other 29 subjects had this kind of remission. There are post-treatment controllers that have been described before and a lot of debate in the field as to whether that's what we're seeing here versus a, quote, cure. So I'm going to stop there. I'll thank the IAS USA. Uh, some of my colleagues, Jeff Lennox and Paul Sachs for slides. Just for next year, will it be virtual or not? Too early to tell, but CROI is planned for March 2021 in Chicago, and IAS is planned for July in Berlin. And I'll stop there, and thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Tripp. Great job. Appreciate it. Um, before, as we get into it, um, one of the things, I think, for historical context regarding the Brazil uh, cure patient is that a lot of us can remember John Sullivan's study out of UMass for a couple of babies with nevirapine, and they also converted their ELISAs within a, several months of, uh, of stopping therapy with nevirapine, but then they all relapsed uh, several years later. So uh, the, the jury's still out, but it's intriguing nonetheless. Okay, here we go. Questions. On the two-drug reg regime with increased biomarkers for inflammation as opposed to the three drug regimens. In the case of early heart disease and other problems, it's been postulated that the inflammatory response was part of the driving force. Are there other studies going to look at this issue? Yes, I, it, you bring up a great point here, and that's the concern, that if you have increased biomarkers of inflammation, could this lead to end organ disease in the long run? Uh, such as heart disease, kidney, neurologic, liver, and cancers. Um, the study I presented, the Spanish cohort, did not see those endpoints, but there are lots of big studies to look at this going on. Thanks. So adverse outcomes in the pregnancy study were greater than 25%. This seems high. What are the AEs? 
Yeah, that's the overall adverse outcome. So uh, that includes a very wide variety, many of which were mild and, and uh, really not considered clinically significant. Right. It could be nausea, for example, or something Correct. like that. Yeah. Thoughts on starting uh, Dietegravir TDF instead of Dietegravir TAF in appropriate patients to avoid weight gain. Uh, also, is TAF uh, removal, does that level where, uh, uh, does it level off the weight gain? Right. So we don't know the best strategy yet. Uh, you're thinking like a researcher, should we compare those approaches, TDF dolutegravir regimen versus a TAF dolutegravir from the get-go and see how people do? Um, I think people are beginning to explore that as an option. Um, if you remove TAF, does the weight level go down? The studies I just showed you, which were not designed to look at it, did not suggest that. It did suggest perhaps stabilization. But honestly, we don't know the best strategy for weight gain just yet. Yeah. And Rafi Landovitz is going to get to this uh, HPTN 083 a little bit more. But the, the couple people who had viral, who got infected in the PrEP study on cabotegravir, do they know why? Was it the tail of the tab cabotegravir? Was it uh, noncompliance with getting yeah. injections? It's such a big study, and uh, Rafi's the chair, so he can comment specifically, but there were lots of different patterns. There were at least a handful of patients who got those injections, yet somehow still seroconverted. Uh, not clear why. Yeah, and then continuing on the thought, the next question is about PrEP and people um, with injection drug use. Um, do you know if cavitegravir might be used there? So I don't believe that injection drug users were necessarily excluded from the studies, although I don't know what percentage of people were in it. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a know, good my, question to bring back to Rafi at the, on the prep section. Yeah, it, it's a really good question. I don't know those data, but, but Rafi may know them. If patients discontinue IVM cabotegravir for prep and then are exposed at some time later, uh, what if the levels aren't high enough? That's getting back to that tail I was just referencing. Yes, so that's a real concern both for treatment or for prevention, that if you have sustained cabotegravir levels, and remember one injection can give you levels for over a year, um, might that be a place where we could begin to induce in, uh, in, uh, integrase resistance if people are exposed to viruses with suboptimal levels of cabotegravir. That remains a theoretical concern, and we're really going to have to be vigilant about that. The way they uh, dealt with that in the PrEP study was actually to switch people back to PO TDF FTC, which would, mm -hmm. as they say, cover the tail. Mm -hmm. What um, Do you believe that the two-drug therapy is here to stay? Is it the next treatment wave of the future? Well, it certainly found its way into guidelines because of excellent randomized head-to-head -head studies um, called the DISCOVER studies that showed non-inferiority of the two-drug regimen to the three-drug regimen. I remember when we saw the 48-week results and everyone kind of gasped and said, wow, it does look non-inferior, but 48 weeks is not so long. But then they went ahead and made the next step and went out to 96 weeks, and it continues to be non-inferior. I think clinically interpreting that, you got to be careful about who you're going to use two drug therapy in, but certainly there are candidate people who would benefit from it um, and perhaps do better without that third drug in the long run. Yeah, we'll talk about this in the cases later this afternoon. Uh, so with the rapid decrease, large decrease in viral load with lenacaprevir, do you think iris will be a concern? Uh, that's an interesting question. Iris is more uh, related to rapid increase in CD4 than the decrease in viral load, because remember the integrase inhibitors do that same thing. Uh, certainly that drug is quite potent. Iris has not yet been described, um, but could be an issue for sure. And do you recommend uh, taking patients who have a weight gain and are on an integrase inhibitor, taking them off of that to try to modulate the weight gain? Again, we don't know the best way to approach weight gain on these regimens. I think um, I would start, and I do start, with diet and exercise being the first thing. 
and really go th going through things. If someone's doing well on an ART regimen, you know, we really have to think carefully before we s switch them to something else because there's always the chance that they will virologically rebound, which of course we don't want to happen. And then there's the potential, obviously, switching meds that you could have new toxicities. Right. Well, we're out of time for questions. There's a few more that I see on the screen in front of me, but um, a lot of those that I see remaining will be addressed either in Dr. Landovitz's section on PrEP or through the Q&A uh, portion of uh, the cases for antiretroviral therapy that I'll be chairing uh, again later this afternoon. Uh, so thanks very much, Dr. Gulick. Great job. Sure. Thanks, Mike. We're all updated now. Excellent. It's a good feeling. <laughs> um, <laughs>